In our second video of Unit 1, Lesson 5, we're going to focus on how electrons are configured in atoms. Now, it's very important to be able to write electron configurations for pretty much uh, any atom on the periodic table that follows the, the patterns for those. So if you uh, took first year chemistry, you probably did something like this, where we have a periodic table and we just uh, try looking at different atoms. So here's carbon. And the way that you write an electron configuration is you always start at the beginning of the table. And we start with 1s2, because there are two boxes there. And then we go to 2s2, and then 2p2. 2 because it's in the 2p section there it's the second box so it's 2p2 now if you want you can abbreviate this by backing up to the most uh, recent uh, noble gas which in this case is helium and then kind of pick up from there so you can say helium 2s2 2p2 and that works as well if you want to try let's say uh, calcium, which is right here. Once again, we always start at the beginning of the periodic table. This is like a, like a bus driver driving along the route, and the bus driver has to hit all the stops, go along all the streets. So it goes 1s2, and then 2s2, 2p6, because there are six boxes in that 2p section, back around to 3s2, and then 3p6, and then 4s2, because calcium is the second box in the 4s section, 4s2. So you can write your electron configuration just like that. If you want to abbreviate it using the noble gas abbreviations, you would back up to uh, argon, which is right before that, and say argon, and then 4s2. So you can do that as well. Let's try uh, this next one here, niobium. So once again, we start at the beginning. It's going to be 1s2, and then 2s2, 2p6, then 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Just keep going in order of these uh, little sections here. 3d and that has 10 boxes 3d 10 and then 4p 6 and back around 5s 2 and then in the 4d section niobium is the third box so it's 4d 3 so you can write it like that or if you want to abbreviate it that would be uh, looks like krypton and then 5s 2 4d 3 so uh, that's how you can write an electron configuration now, maybe you're wondering, what does all this stuff mean? You know, they got the S's and the P's and the D's and all that, and sometimes the F's, as you see here at the bottom of the table. Well, we can actually write an orbital notation. Now, the way this works is if we use the electron configuration for carbon, each little section here represents, we can draw it with lines, 1s, 2s, and, and 2p. Your S sections will always have one line or one orbital as we say the the p's will have three lines or three orbitals and, and you just start putting arrows on the line so 1s2 represents that put one arrow up one going down and we use the Aufbau principle here the idea is that electrons are added to these orbitals and sublevels in a specific order it goes in increasing energy, generally speaking. So we go with 1s, and then we do 2s. So 2s2, we got two arrows there, one going up, one going down. And then we have 2p2. The first one goes right there. Now, where would the second one go? You might think right next to it, but actually it doesn't. There's a, a rule called Hund's rule. And Hund's rule says that no electron can be paired until every orbital in that section or, or that sublevel has one electron in it. So that means that you can't double up until every one of these lines has an arrow on it. So that means that our second electron will actually have to go right here. So that's the orbital notation when you draw the arrows on the lines. 
Now, there is some vocabulary that we need to be aware of. We've already talked about energy levels. We have the one and the, the twos here. Those represent energy levels. But the S's and the P's represent sublevels. And so this 2P, as an example, we'd call that the 2P sublevel. Every one of these sections in the electron configuration represents a sublevel. Now, within each sublevel, we have each individual line. Each line represents an orbital. And we'll talk about what an orbital is here shortly. So orbitals are like this. And so we would have, you know, each 2p sublevel would have three orbitals represented. In this one, only two of those orbitals are occupied. This last one, of course, is empty. Now, let's try this with another element that's a little bit more complex. Let's try selenium. And so we'll put all these uh, orbital uh, lines on here in the sublevels as well. And just so that there's no confusion, anytime we have an S sublevel, notice it only has one line, one orbital. All the P sublevels have three. So here's 2P and 3P. And there's 4p up there as well. Each of those has three lines or three orbitals. And there is a d sublevel here in the 3d. It has five orbitals. And so we're going to uh, start f filling those up. So we'll start with 1s2. By the way, if you ever get to f, it's going to be seven orbitals. But we don't usually do that in AP chemistry. So 1s has two. So we'll Pair them up like this. And just so you know, the reason that they're going in opposite directions, one arrow is going uh, up and one arrow is going down, is we have something called the Pauli exclusion principle. And this basically tells us that no two electrons in an atom can have the same quantum states. And so what that means is the two electrons have to be spinning in opposite directions. So if one is spinning like this, that means the other has to be spinning in the opposite direction. So that's why they're, they're in, in, you have two arrows in, in different directions. Now, 2s2 looks like that. And then 2p6, we got 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, just like we did for Hund's rule. Put one on each line before you double up. And then 3s2. And to speed things along, we'll do the 3p6 and the 4s2 and the 3d10. We've got those 10 arrows there. Now, for 4p4, we have to follow Hund's rule. One, two, three, and now we can double up. Okay, so that's the orbital notation diagram for selenium. Now I want you to notice something here. We've got two unpaired electrons. They're just sitting in their orbitals by themselves. So since we have unpaired electrons in this atom, we call this atom paramagnetic it exerts a special type of magnetism called paramagnetism. Now, that's not something that you have to worry too much about, but it is a very interesting type of magnetism that you can learn about and research on your own. Now, let's try another one. Let's try argon. So argon has this electron configuration. We're going to set up the lines. There's our set of lines, our, our uh, orbital notation lines here. So we'll just run through here 1s2. And then 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p6. So that fills everything up. So I want you to notice that in argon, all of the uh, electrons, and each electron is represented by an arrow, all the electrons are paired up. None of them are just kind of unpaired like we had in the last example. When you have this, this is called diamagnetic. So if an, an atom doesn't have any unpaired electrons, we say it's diamagnetic. So there's paramagnetic and there's diamagnetic. So it's interesting to know uh, the difference between those. Now, when we say orbital, an orbital is basically just a region of space where you are most likely to find an electron. It's like if I say, what is a hallway? Well, if you're in a school, a hallway is a place where you're likely to find students uh, moving around between classes. So, for example, an s orbital, if we were just to plot where these electrons are, just different you know, flashes in time, it might look something like this. 
This might be the plot of one electron over a certain period of time. And we can see that for the most part, it has a roughly spherical or circular shape there. This is not in 3D, just a, just a picture. Uh, sometimes it goes outside that orbital, but for the most part, it's inside that area. Now, a p orbital, if you were to plot a p orbital, perhaps every second, just take a, just a, just take a flash picture every, every second of a p orbital over a certain period of time, it might look more like this. And that has what seems to be more like a figure eight structure. Now, a d orbital might look more like this. If we take that same flash every, every second or so, and this looks more like a butterfly or possibly a, a four leaf clover. These are the general shapes of the orbitals. S orbitals have a spherical shape. P orbitals have this figure eight shape. And most of the time, d orbitals have this four leaf clover type of shape. Uh, and when we talk about an orbital, this is where electrons will spend about 90% of their time. So that means sometimes, as you can see in each of these plots, they do go outside of their orbital sometimes, but they'll spend the vast majority of their time in the orbital. Now, if you were to plot all these orbitals, because we've been looking at you know 1s and 2s and 2p, all of these orbitals, and just plot them and see what this whole thing looks like. This is what it would look like. The nucleus is, as we've said earlier, unimaginably tiny in there. All of these sublevels and orbitals are being superimposed over each other in this picture. So what we have is basically all these orbitals moving around essentially on top of each other or over each other. And this is what you have in an atom. It looks like chaos. It seems to be rather orderly, as it turns out. Whenever we talk about the ways that you can uh, uh, predict the electron configuration for atoms. Hope you learned something from my video. I'm Jeremy Krug. Uh, hope you'll join me for the next video, which is going to cover Unit 1, Section 6.